You stole my thunder. Are we up here, Nate? Okay. There it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's great how the Lord works things out. Somebody said that to you. You're in a conversation. You're standing in front of folks. You're at a meeting. Somebody says to you, you stole my thunder. He or she. <laughs> That'd be great. So what do you think when somebody says that to you? What are they saying? What is he saying to you? What is he saying? Pardon me? Spirit, he says. Message, glory, power, I think somebody's. Recognition, okay. It's a quip. It's a common quip, isn't it? As a matter of fact, it's an idiom. When they uh, teach people English, this is idiom number 17, at least in the curriculum I looked at. Idiom number 17. You stole my thunder. And they're talking about the point that I was going to make. It's kind of like somebody, you're, you're telling a joke, and as you're telling the joke, you know, it's like, okay, a guy goes in and he sits down in the barber shop, and they throw out the towel or whatever that thing is, they put around his neck and they tie him up and they said, oh, hey, can you cut my hair by leaving it really long and dangly, just a couple of strands on this side, and, and cut the sideburns so that they're not you know, even, like one is up here and the other's down here and kind of long and shavy. And, and when you shave the back, nick it a couple times over here and over there. And, and when, you, when you cut here, make sure that, that it's off so that it kind of hangs out more on this side and it's tighter on that side. And the guy looked at him and said, I can't cut your hair like that. And the guy said, why not? She did it last time. <laughs> You steal the thunder when some of you start. And the guy came in and he sat down and they threw this thing. Oh, yeah, you did it the last time. That's stealing your thunder. That's, that's how it goes. And you know, it's rough sometimes to get your thunder stolen. Right? I mean, especially when it's something that's really big and it's, it's something that you're wanting to say and, and then he goes, Pfft. it's rough. Well, this morning, we're going to look at two guys who uh, had their thunder tampered with by Jesus Christ. For everybody's good. For everybody's good. Their own and the good of these guys. I, I want you to turn with me here to take a look at Mark chapter 3. Will you turn there with me? We're going to look at two guys. Both of these guys interact with the Lord and their thunder is tampered with by him. And this same Jesus Christ, who these guys were in a discipleship relationship to, I mean like really big time, these were his closest guys in the D-band for him. They were the closest. And these two guys interacting with Jesus Christ and him tempering, tampering with their thunder kind of teaches us something that we can learn here. 
You see, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8 says. Us. What he did with them, he does with us for our good and for everybody's good. He's the same. And we're going to take a look at this, if you're with me, what the Lord does in tampering with some thunder. I'm in Mark chapter 3. I'm going to have you look with me at verse 13. And he went on to the mountain, or he went up on the mountain, and the Bible tells us in another place that he prayed. He prayed all night. And he called to him whom he desired that they might be with him. He appointed them, the twelve. He named them apostles so that they might be with him. You know, last week we looked at personality. It's kind of the beginning of our whole series here, personality in the master's plan. We looked at this, and we looked at there is a master plan for you and for me. It is massive, it's all-encompassing, and includes every detail. And if you weren't in on that, we covered how the Lord told us that in various ways, and it'd be good for you to check in on. It includes personality for sure. Adam and Eve and all of the personality from there on out. It includes your personality and mine coming into Christ. And we saw this. There's a master plan. And we looked at this master plan and we noticed what the master plan is, that there is and is in the master plan. And the master plan is for you and for me and for others that they might be with him. They called them, like we're looking at here in Mark 3, 13 and 14, so that they were to be with him. That's what the master plan is, to be with him, to be with him, because there is nothing like being with Jesus. There is nothing. There is nothing like doing. And he can be with you in everything, or we can intentionally keep him excluded from some things. But his plan, the master's plan, when he called them, was to be with him in the everything that he was going to be taking them through with him. It's the master's plan. And these guys were noted much later that they had been with Jesus in the way they were. They were just common folks. Had no super education. Just common folks who've been with him. So we talked about the master's plan and what the is is in the master's plan. And that there was a first person in this master's plan. If you're with me, look here at Mark chapter 3. Verse 13, he went into the mountain, he prayed all night, and he called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also called the sent ones, so they might be with him, and that he might send them out to minister, to talk, to preach. And he gave them authority, apostolic authority, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. He describes that, apostolic signs of an apostle. He gave them that, and he appointed the twelve, Simon, whom he named Peter. That was the first one in this master's plan. Peter. And you remember Peter, right? We talked about Peter. Recall that discussion we had about Peter? If not, I really ask you to get online and, and get this. Because this is the Lord working with personality, and he intentionally includes personality, your personality, in this, to be with him. And what he did with Peter, Peter, we talk, he was a big guy. 
He was, he was brash. He, in our D-band, we, it was said that he was kind of hasty in what he did. He, he just jumped. Spoke, not even knowing what he was talking. Climbing out of a boat, walking on water, and then losing it. He was inconsistent. Big, brash, inconsistent in being with Jesus. He becomes bold. When they saw the boldness of Peter, when they saw the boldness, that he was an uneducated and, and common man, they took note that he'd been with Jesus. Boldness in Peter. And the love that was in Peter. Above all things, fervently love one another from the heart, Peter says. He became a bold, loving Peter. Solid rock. It's changed. What he was to what being with Jesus shaped him into. Big, brash, hasty, inconsistent guy to a bold, loving, solid as a rock. And Jesus said this from the beginning. That Peter, that's what you are, and that's what I make you, and that's what I build you. And when he talks about this first one, Peter, Simon, he, whom Jesus called Peter, he changed his name. He gave him that nickname. You know, there's two other guys here, too. And there are two other guys that, uh, well, let's see, how should I say this? You shouldn't miss. As a matter of fact, these are two guys who you can't miss if you hang around with Jesus, the way he interacted. Look at verse 17. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom Jesus gave the name Baranages. That is, by way of explanation, sons of thunder. I see, Peter from the beginning, and then when he calls him to himself, and it's made perfectly clear that this Simon, this vacillating, shifting sand guy, he becomes a solid rock on which he says that I will build my church on what you're standing for. And now he has these two guys, and he calls them sons of thunder. Boanerges. That's kind of a cool word, isn't it? Boanerges. Say this with me. Boanerges. Say this with me. You've got to put the, the emphasis on the right syllable here. Boanerges. There you go. Boanerges. Boanerges. They show up and Boanerges. Jesus called them Boanerges, sons of thunder. <laughs> thunder. <laughs> That's what he called them. What's he, what, 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 what you doing here? Is this kind of the same like you're doing with Peter? It's like you're going to build this guy into a vacillating solid sand? Comes to be a rock that's... Branches. You know, when you look at Jesus, sometimes you, well, people, they kind of wonder. I mean, if he was going to do this, why didn't he do it a little more organized? I mean, he calls these 12 guys, and six of the 12 guys share names. Simon, two Simons, Two Judases. Somebody else? Shared a name. James! James. Two Simons. Two Judases. And two James. That only leaves six other names. It gets confusing. Bargies! What are you doing? He's going to make it clear through what unfolds to us. He makes us clear, just like he did with Peter. 
He makes it clear. And you know, life is kind of like that sometimes. We look at it, what are you doing, Lord? What's going on here? It ought to be more arranged. It ought to make some more sense. He knows the plans he has for you. What he's doing. What am I supposed to do? Get with him. Get with him. That's what he's up to here. Sometimes the things that go on in your life just kind of drive you to the Lord. Oh, that's a bad thing. It seems like a bad thing, but man, it gets you where you need to be, and that's with him. You know what the Bible says when things are going good? You know what it says? Somebody happy? James chapter 5, you know what the Bible says? Let them sing. Let them sing. Sing, sing, sing to the Lord. If things are tough, you know what the Bible says? Let them pray. James chapter 5. It seems that everything goes to him. It's a plan. It's a plan. It all. See if you can say this with me. For from him and through him and to him are all things. All things. And that's where the things in your life are to be taking you. To him. So, in this, we're going to talk about two things. Relative to personality. This one first. Relative to personality, what the Lord has to work with. That's the first thing. What the Lord has to work with in <clears throat> Peter, James, John, the sons of thunder. What, what he has to work with. And here's the second thing. Relative to personality, what work the Lord has to do with James, John, Peter, Jew, me. Let's talk about the first one. To make the most of time here, He knows who he's dealing with. He knows. Look at how he says here. If you're with me, Mark chapter 3, look at what this says. He went into the mountain. He prayed all night, verse 13. We get that from other accounts of this in the Gospels. And then he came down from the mountain. He called to himself those whom he desired. These are the ones. Now, this was not the first time that he encountered these guys. This is into Jesus' ministry. It's not like really far, but we are like into it. In John chapter 1, we have Jesus being introduced by John the baptizer, and he meets John there. And he meets Andrew and Peter on those days. And time rolls along. We go down the road a bit, some years or so. And he knows these guys, and he calls whom he desires, and they came to him, and he appointed them so that they might be with them, and he sent them out. Interesting thing. He desirously called these guys their personalities, and he appointed them. He knows. As a matter of fact, look at what he said in another place. Jesus in John chapter 13, when, when his ministry had gotten along, he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. If you have a relationship with Christ, you did not choose him, but what? He chose you. He chose you. And he appointed 
you, he says. And he goes on here. He chose you and appointed you for this purpose, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should be made, that there should be productivity that comes out of your life, fruit bearing to God, something that goes on not just for time but for eternity. This is what the Lord says. He desirously calls and appoints, and he knows who he chooses, and he appoints those he chooses to bring forth fruit that goes on for time and for eternity. that your fruit should be made. And he ends this by saying, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give you. Being with him. Getting with him. In what he's doing. Here's, here's the first point relative to personality that the Lord has to work with. He knows He knows the areas of strength, the areas of shortcoming, the areas you draw back, the areas you go forward, the areas you struggle with him on, the areas you fight and dig in your heels with him on, the areas you are so enthusiastic you just wish everybody could see. He knows. And he calls and he appoints. Second thing here. Why does he call him the son of thunder? Why did he do that? We know why he called Peter, Peter from the beginning and why he said it in the middle and why he said it at the end when he told him to build the church on what he was saying. This is solid rock stuff here, Peter. Stand on this. Peter does. Why does he call these guys? I think you'll see this in a couple of snapshots. They're thunderous guys. It's a caricaturization. I did a little Google search on Sons of Thunder. You know who that is? Chuck Norris! Did you know that there was a show, Sons of Thunder and Walker, Texas Ranger? Did you know that? I didn't know it either. There's a show. I wonder how popular it was. I don't know. Sons of Thunder. Here's some other Sons of Thunder. These guys are a power lifting group. Look at those arms. Yeah. Matter of fact, they kind of travel around and do this power show. Sons of Thunder. That's, a, that's characterization. Here's some Sons of Thunder. <laughs> this is a motorcycle group called the Sons of Thunder. Kind of outstanding. A little loud, too. And of course, there has to be a rock band. As a matter of fact, there was more than one called the Sons of Thunder. Yeah. And not only that, there's a cartoon. Well, at least a comic series called the Son of Thunder. What is this? Arak? A-R-A-K? How would you say that? Ark? I don't know. There it is. Sons of Thunder. Everybody's as bold as I was on that one. Sons of Thunder. Jesus called them Sons of Thunder. This is kind of how it comes up in our times and generations, the Sons of, sons of Thunder. He called them the Sons of Thunder, and we're going to see why he does. And this Son of Thunder that he names first, one that had two names, I mean, guys both had the same name, he called him James. And to designate him, yep, James, the sons of Zebedee, which is important. But over time, the, the church over time, and, and actually people who study the Bible call him James the Greater. Because there was a guy named James, well, he's right here, this other James. Look down in the list of the twelve, where he calls John and James the, the sons of thunder. And there's Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew. And James, the son of Alphaeus, that guy right there, the son of Alphaeus, was known as James the Less. And the reason being, this James had a more prominent position. He was in the tighter group 
with Jesus. He's the one that saw the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus' face was changed and became bright as the sun and his clothes, and they saw it. I mean, it was like a transformer going on right in front of them, only it wasn't like imagination. It was like real, transformed, transfigured, they called it in the Bible. He was there when they raised Jarvis from the Jarvis's daughter from the dead when they saw that girl laying there pale with that color that that comes on and been there and little girl arise. And her eyes open and she sits up and who is there? was in on that. And all of them, this one, James. And he was there in the garden spot when he was sweating like drops of blood and he comes back and they're like, <laughs> guys, couldn't you? He's there. The hours come on us. Let's get up. He was a prominent one. He was also called James the Senior, James Major, because of the two, John and James, who were the sons of thunder. He was the more, he was the older, he was the elder of the, he was the more outgoing of them. So that's the James we're talking about. This is the James, James the Greater, James the son of Zebedee, two sons. Now this morning we're going to look at some selected passages, and we're going to look at these. Uh, we're going to look to see how James and his personality comes out. Now we're going to do some quick action shots. And I want you to see from this how James was and how the Lord grew him to make the most of his times. Because the days had some trouble. And from this, we'll learn about the Lord helping us. So let's talk about relative to what the Lord has to do. Personality. And we're going to do this with action clips. First one right here, since we're in Mark, this is the beginning of the ministry. Go to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, action clips of James Balanages in process with Jesus. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we're going to pick up at verse number 14 where it says this. Now, after John was arrested, this is the Gospel of Mark, and Mark's Gospel goes really fast. It it's, was written for a specific purpose to some folks that didn't keep their attention on some things, so he, he talks real fast. As a matter of fact, at chapter 1, verse 1, he begins the Gospel, and, and chapter nine, chapter 1, verse 9, these are the days when John the Baptist came, and then chapter... 1 verse 12, he's already into Matthew 4 because he's going out into the wilderness by the Spirit that took him there. And now John's arrested. All of that in 14 verses in this ministry of Jesus' life. And this is after John was arrested. Jesus came in Galilee and he's proclaiming the good news of, of God's work. And he's saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the gospel. And he's passing through this area by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Simon and Andrew. Now, this has been moved along. We have already had the introduction to Jesus. That was John chapter 1, when John the Baptist was saying, look right there, there's the Lamb of God. And John and Andrew begin to follow him, and Andrew goes, gets his brother Simon, and Simon is brought to Jesus, and Jesus sees him the first time, and he says, Simon, your name is going to be Rock. First thing he said to me. Now this is later on 
when Jesus is passing through this area and he sees these guys who he already knows, John, Andrew, Peter, because he spent some time with them already. And he said to them, verse 17, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They're called from this introduction into a discipleship. Follow me. And immediately they left. And going a little further, verse 19, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Now, I want you to know there's something different here between John, Peter, Andrew, and James. On that first day, the intro day, in John 1, Jesus met James, excuse me, he met John, Andrew, Peter. But James wasn't there. He wasn't around. He's probably off taking care of business. He was a businessman. His father, Zebedee appears to be a very wealthy businessman. They had a fishing business where they hired people to work with them. That's kind of unheard of unless this is kind of a really big business. He was influential in the town. As a matter of fact, his family was known by the high priest. They're up at the Sea of Galilee. This was all the way down in Jerusalem that he was known, and usually that's because somebody had money that it spoke to the high priest. Can you imagine that? They're known. James wasn't around when Jesus was introed. Andrew, Peter, John. But here, Jesus comes across their path. I'm sure he's heard about him. Everybody's kind of been hearing about him. In verse 19, when he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat, mending the nets, and immediately called them, and they left. Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Haven't you ever kind of wondered about that? Just kind of walking along. Hey, come with me. Oh, okay. He goes. Uh, that's the kind of way it appears, but it's not like these James or John, Andrew, and Peter didn't know of him before and see what he was doing. James, however, didn't meet him. He only heard. And James just kind of gets up and he goes. You know, there's some people like that. You talk to them and they go do it. They just do it. Some people we talk to about some things and next thing you know, they're on the phone and they're doing it. And there's some people who go, who, me? I'm supposed to do that? I didn't know you meant me when you said that. James, he's up and he's on. That was James. He was on. Lightning comes, there's the thunder. He's on. It was kind of like a close lightning for James. You know how you notice how the difference between lightning that's close and not. You know how you can tell the difference when lightning is close and it's not close. It's like when it strikes, you get thunder like right now. Usually, it's loud and kind of shaky. And then sometimes, if you see the lightning, and it's like that that that's lightning's far away. This is striking. He was fast. That's the son of thunder. He was. He, he's on it. That's, that's clip number one, how this goes. As a matter of fact, they were so fast about this that they left Zebedee in the boat. Hey, see ya. That's fast. I wonder what Zebedee's thinking, don't you? Hey, guys! Wasn't planning on this. Somebody was. Somebody was. Second action clip. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9. 
You can't keep all in Mark, but we'll spend a lot of time in Mark, but can't keep all because the next, the next in the series of shots that we see of, of James in action comes in Luke chapter 9. So I'm going to ask you to turn there. It's the book right next to Mark as you're going to the back of the Bible, Luke chapter 9. And Luke chapter 9, this is now further along. The, the first one was about 29 AD. This is into the 30 AD. Uh, this is a snapshot of James. And, and here we see Boanerges at work. Jesus chapter 9, verse 1, just to give you some context here. Jesus has called the 12, and he's appointed them, and he sent them out. Verse 10, they return. They give an account. Jesus foretells his coming death after Peter makes the profession of faith. You're the Christ, verses 18 through 20, and Luke 9. And Jesus talks to them and begins to explain to them about his impending death. 23 through 27. And now after eight days, verse 28. After saying these things, he takes Peter, John, and James, and they went into the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, this is when he was transformed. His face was altered. The clothing dazzled white like the sun, Matthew says. And behold, there were two men, the days of Elijah, the days of Moses. Suddenly, these two guys... They materialized there while they were in the mountain and they're praying. They're standing there and they've got a little tired, but all of a sudden Jesus' face starts to change and there's two guys that materialize and are standing there talking to him. And what are we talking about here? Are we watching some kind of science fiction thriller? That was hard to say. Fiction is how that word goes. No, this is real. They materialized. They're in front of him. And behold, the two men are talking with Jesus, verse 31, and they're talking about his departure. And they're talking about what he's going to do at Jerusalem. It's just coming up. And you know what happens, Peter, with the way he is, he just starts talking, he doesn't know what he's saying, the Lord quiets him down because God overshadows with a voice, listen, Peter, don't talk, listen. That's what he said. Listen. As a matter of fact, the Bible says specifically, he interrupted Peter at the time and he said, listen, this is my beloved son. Next day, verse 37, They meet the unclean spirit. And now this is where I want you to slide to verse verse 51. Verse 51, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, just like he spoke about with Moses and Elijah. And the days drew near for him to be taken up. It's now come the time that Jesus is to go to heaven again. And so he set his face to go to Jerusalem. You know what it looks like to set your face? Here, do this with me. Set your face. Set your face. You know, some, set your face. Sometimes people set their face. You're talking to somebody, and they want you to know that they are not listening to you, so they set their face. And then sometimes somebody sets their face, like they're going somewhere, and they're like, you say, hey, can I be in it? And they set their face, right? I mean, you look at somebody and you know, they have set their face. Some people say this to me when I'm riding my bike and like I'm going to work and I've got to be at a meeting like in two minutes and I've got three minutes of time to travel here. That's, and somebody, you look like a man on a mission. Jesus. The man on a mission. And it was evident. It was evident. Is it always bad not to be this like open to whatever's going on? No, Jesus said his face with determination. 
to go to Jerusalem. Does that mean that he was totally uncaring? Absolutely not. He was very caring in what he was doing. And his face was set to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered. It, see, like it wasn't like, la, da, la, whatever going on goes on. He sent people ahead of him with a plan. And he's still doing that, and he's still doing it with personalities, and that's what he was doing with Peter, and that's what he's doing with James, and that's what he's doing with John, and that's what he's doing with you. He sent them ahead with a plan, and they went into the village of Samaria to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set to go to Jerusalem. And they saw it and they go, Ew! No, that wasn't it. That really wasn't. This was the Samaritans. You know the Samaritans and the Jews, how they got along? You remember that? We've gone over this before. The Book of Kings talks about the king of Assyria coming down and taking part of them away in the exile, and he left some of them there, and these people got intermarried, and they got all mixed up, and they had pagan religion with some of the Bible, and they kind of mixed it up, just kind of like today. Matter of fact, it's a whole bunch of like today. It's a whole bunch of pagan ideas and kind of stuff that you get from the... Who knows where. And you mix it in with what the Bible has to say. Now, there's a process of all of us where we have to grow out of what we've had and start to think God's way. But these people wouldn't get out of it because they've already been introduced to Jesus being the Messiah. They already know it in Samaria because Jesus came there in John chapter 3, John chapter 4. And so they see him and they're kind of like saying, you're... You're about this stuff, this feast of the Jews, and we say on Mount Gerizim, and you say in Jerusalem, and so, you know. Now, here's, here's James and John. James and John see this, and they say, Oh, Lord, isn't this sad? What kind of God? This is what they do. And when the disciples, James and John, saw it, verse 54, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Just like, that's what you get. Don't mess with me. Do you see why they were called sons of thunder? Ambitious, outgoing fast to act, and hard driving here. I mean, you get in my way, guess what? I melt you, buddy. That's what happens. People like that. And Jesus responds to them. This is the training. Jesus responds to them. And he turned. He turned. He turned like the direction we're going turned and he rebuked them As a matter of fact if you see the rest of this verse some of you have it in your footnote where it says this and he said to them footnote number two in the ESV some of it have it right in the text he said you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. The Son of Man came not to destroy people's lives, but to save them. He didn't come to make them toast. He came to rescue them. The spirit that you're of is not the spirit of me. Isn't this amazing? Here they were, hanging with Jesus. They were hanging with him. They were hanging with him. And still, the spirit that they got in their own thinking was totally contrary to him. You know, we, can we do that? Can we do that? Can we kind of like, oh, this is for Jesus. I'm so doing this. And yet it's totally my own thinking here. And Jesus turns. And he corrects that. 
And he says, what we're after is to rescue people. That was Boranerges. One last clip. Actually, there's two, but this is the last action clip. The, the next clip is, well, you'll see. Go with me to Mark 10. In Mark chapter 10, in Mark chapter 10, we have this clip. Back again towards the front of the Bible from Luke. Mark chapter 10, verse number 32. This is now later yet in Jesus' ministry. We are getting like really close to the end. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, this, this trip. And, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. I mean, things are getting really intense. And they're talking, the 12 were talking among themselves. And he began to tell them what's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. He said this, verse 33, he said, See, we are going to Jerusalem. He had set his face, this is later on, they've traveled and we're going up there, and the Son of Man will be delivered. This is actually the third time he tells them this. You're going to be delivered over to the chief priests, to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise from the dead. That is like really clear, and he said it the third time over. And James and John, they're sitting here, and they had heard him talk a little bit while ago, like just a few, just a few hours ago, about how when he comes and sets up in the regeneration, that you guys are going to be sitting on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And you know, if you know the book of Revelation, you know how that fits in. And so there, and Jesus is telling, we're going to Jerusalem and this is what's coming down. And look at verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and they said to him, Teacher, we would like you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. You know, sometimes when my kids were little, they'd come up to me and they'd say, Dad, I want you to give me whatever I say. And I said, mm. You know, at work, I have people that come in and say, Hey, we want you to do what we're going to tell you. And I said, What is that? Doesn't matter. We want you to do it. I am usually pretty <laughs> hesitant. Fast acting, hard driving, usually not with something like that. I kind of. Well, what about the Lord? Whatever we ask, we want you to do. Whatever I come up with, what do you think they're going to come up with? Here. And he said to them, verse 36, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. Hey, you know, when this thing comes and you set up in power to rule and reign, I want to be your right hand man and John gets to be your left hand man. Now, it's interesting here that Matthew tells us mom was in on this too. Because mom had kind of gotten with them. And as a matter of fact, it looks like these guys have kind of coaxed mom to come along with them here. So mom is with them. And my mom says that you need to. And whatever we ask. Whoa. You know, and how could Jesus deny? I mean, you know who she was? She, let's see if I can pronounce this, S-A-L-O-E-N-A. How do you pronounce that? That was her name. 
And she had actually traveled with Jesus and actually supported him and, and made food and that kind of stuff with him. And she is wanting this for us when you come in glory. Yeah. Cluelessly aggressive. Cluelessly aggressive. Because he has just been painting out to them what's coming down here. So, Jesus says to them, verse 38, You don't know. This is clueless. You do not know what you are asking. You are clueless. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism that I'm being baptized with? And what is that? I'm going to Jerusalem they're going to capture me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to beat me up. They're going to make me a pulp. They're going to deliver me over to the Gentiles. I'm going to be killed. That's what's coming down. Can you drink of that? Yep. We can. That's what he says. Look at this. And they said to him, we're able. We can do it. You know what's big in their eyes? This glory, me on the throne, beside you, this is going to be huge. I am like so for it. Whatever it takes, let's do it. <sighs> Cluelessly aggressive. Jesus responds to it. And he said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But as to sit on my right hand and on my left, it's not mine to give. But it's for those to whom it has been prepared. And the rest of the guys, when they heard about this, verse 41, they were like so enthusiastic. They started saying, yes, James, yes, John, four more years, four more years, four more years. No. It says that they were like ticked off. They, like, they were indignant at James and John. And Jesus calls and he gives them a lesson. He says, hey guys, with you, it's not like the Gentiles because he who's going to lead has to be like number one servant. He's got to be thinking and looking, what are the needs of these folks and going after that with all his might. That's what it is. It's a servant. Jesus trains him, this clueless aggressive. So this is it. Fast driving, Boanerges. Fast acting, hard driving, cluelessly aggressive. That's what they were. That's what it was. Jesus identified them. He characterized them. And this last clip, quick, the last clip. Go with me to Acts chapter 12. Here's the last clip. Hey, do you feel any more comfortable following Jesus when you see the kind of guys that he chose desirously to be with him? Do you kind of think, hey, you know, maybe we can do something here. Maybe this... Maybe we can go somewhere, Lord. Maybe maybe something can happen. Yeah. Okay. Chapter 12. <laughs> this is after Jesus has already died and ascended and rescued us and came and gave us the Spirit, and the Spirit is working, and they're bearing witness. And about this time, Acts 12, 1, Herod the king, this is not Herod, the one who was kind of like, you know, seeing Jesus and send him back, you know, the purple robe and all that. And, you know, do this miracle stuff. This is, this is his, his nephew. And the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. End of story. Time's up. James, it's done. You're gone. Here's how it goes. This is the story... Herod was kind of not happy with this church thing going on. So he killed one of the apostles, one of the close guys, James, the brother of John, with a sword. And which that means he hacked his head off. And when Herod saw that this pleased the Jews, then he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And this was during the days of unleavened bread. Here's what we see. Serving now in this. Why does he take James? <laughs> Power had come on him and James was serving. 
James was serving. And in his serving, he got in trouble. And the trouble was hard. And it was difficult. And it took him to the place where he lost his head. Can I tell you that sometimes we have opinions. We're quick and we have opinions and we're after them and we're clueless. But we're going after them and the Lord has to deal with us. And he's got to bring us to the place where we say, what I'm in now is what I have to serve the Lord. I've got to take the real circumstances with the real people and the real places and the real tensions, and I need to serve him now. I need to see what I can do to strengthen other people, what I can say, what I can give. Peter, rock. James, five years into the church, This is one of the guys you worked on. Gone. His time's up. You know, the fact of the matter is, none of us know when our time is up. Gone. It's over. Time's up. There, there's a guy who's a pastor, and he's got a watch that says on it, You <laughs> is on one hand are going to die is on the other. And that would be neat watch. But all of that is to remind him it's this now. It's now. It's with the people you live with now that you serve. Hey, let me end with this. Some really do die like this. ISIS, some are really dying like this. Some really do some men die in the fire. Some men die in the flames. But most men die by inches while playing silly games. Because they're all tied up on what they want rather than serving in the now. Do you see what the Lord has for you to do? It's get with Him. Spend time with him. And as you are with him, he opens up doors of people and interaction. And it's serving them in the now. Some of them lost. Some of them saved. Thinking about how I can serve these people so that they will listen to the gospel. Seeing how I can encourage these so they'll go forward and they'll grow and they'll change like the Lord has to do with all of us. And it's in the now. It's in the now. How about you? You see, it's only one life. There's only one. So we soon be passed. My. You're dying. Only what's done for Christ in service last. What's done for Christ is done for other people. Father in heaven, we come to you with a with with a, a heart to hear a heart to hear that you're up to something that it, that it's definite and this stuff isn't perchance it's not crazy it's not out of control it's like lost it's like no and this stuff is gathering us to be with you and to carry a message to the north and the south and the east and the west and wherever you call us to because you're with us Jesus' name. Amen.